Uh, thank you all for coming here. It's a pleasure to speak in front of all of you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about, well, geometry. I think a lot of us, when we think about geometry, we probably remember some basic shapes, triangle, pentagram, things that we learned long ago. Maybe we remember using this thing to measure angles. Often our exposure to geometry is in high school, and we are mostly just sort of pumping through proofs, maybe looking at uh, diagrams like this, okay, alpha is to alpha, beta is to beta, and so on, special triangles, these kind of things. So while these rules are important and they're true, they miss the big picture. And I'd like to show you a little bit today about what that big picture could be, what is the promise of geometry. So to me in my research, geometry is just the way that we describe any shape and the shape of anything, really. And lots of things, actually all the things around us have some kind of shape. So it might be our human form, and we might use a geometric representation of our human form on the computer to do things like computer graphics for visual effects and video games. It might be the buildings that we uh, uh, go inside and visit. So the CN Tower is made up of different pieces and different uh, architectural elements. Each of those elements has some geometry. Geometry, of course, uh, exists at different scales. So even inside of our bodies, our muscles and bones each have geometry. And understanding that geometry is what gives uh, physicians the ability to diagnose and fix problems. OK, so my research is about how do we leverage computers and modern computing to bring geometry, uh, to bring the most that we can from geometric data. So uh, as we look to uh, applications that we would like to see, dream technologies like self-driving cars, you can see that geometry is really essential to these, uh, to these technologies. So this is an example uh, recently released from Tesla of what their AI self-driving car sees. And what does it see? Well, it sees images, but it's also seeing the different geometries uh, in the scene in front of the car. So we see passing cars, we see pedestrians, we see the static geometry of the buildings, and so on. So if we're to truly realize self-driving cars, we'll need these cars to understand all of these different geometries and, and their dynamic. And the stakes are rather large, right? When the self-driving car fails, when any kind of driving, driving fails, it can be catastrophic. The problem is that the geometric data that we capture out in the world is quite messy. So this is an example of an arterial scan. And you might be looking at this scan if you're hunting for an aneurysm, if you're trying to diagnose uh, whether or not there's a problem inside of this uh, arter ar artery um, that, that could cause almost sudden death for a patient. So in my research, I look at geometry, and I look at even very basic questions. And when we try to move that geometry onto the computer, often the answers are quite tricky themselves. So even the most fundamental question of how should we store a shape on the computer can have a tricky answer. So you think about like, how do we store things on the computer, right? So we have a text document or a book. We might first break apart the language of that book into uh, small pieces, the words. And then each of the letters of the word could be break, broken down into an encoding system that assigns it to zeros and ones, the bits that we've heard about. Well, we would need to do the same thing for the geometric shapes that we saw before. How can we break these down into discrete units that the computer can understand? So once we've stored the geometry on the computer, then we somehow need the computer to understand in our algorithms what is the shape. And a fundamental question about the shape that we might want to ask is, given some point in space, is that point in my shape or is it outside of my shape? A lot of interesting algorithms like simulation uh, start here. So if we want to simulate the leg interaction between the muscles and the bones, we need to know what part of space is inside the muscle, is inside the bone, and what's just air around our geometry. So we can start this uh, investigation by looking at two-dimensional shapes. So let's consider a 2D shape. So this is a, a 2D shape of a, a cartoon alligator. Most of us are familiar with uh, 2D shapes on the computer stored as images. So we could store this as a collection of pixels, small uh, squares that store the color of, of the object. 
Um, but here we're really doing something very, very expensive. So we're storing millions and millions of pixels just for this cartoon alligator. How is this possibly going to scale up to something like the 3D CN tower or all of the anatomy in our body, right? And we're kind of mixing two different pieces of information. There's the shape of the alligator and there's also the color. And we've, we've combined those together in this image representation. So instead, if we want to focus on the geometry of this shape, we could go back to the original uh, alligator here and we could say, okay, instead I'm going to store just the geometry of this alligator by looking at its outline. And then if I zoom in on the outline, I can store this curve as a collection of points that are ordered and I, I store the uh, line segments between them. So really all we've done here is we've just stored it as a really big complex polygon. And that's fine. This is something that the computer can then understand. So let me go to an example of what we can do once we have this kind of representation. All right, so I'm loading a little program here that I've written. Uh, here's our alligator. And I can draw some interaction widgets on top of this alligator. So I'm, I'm laying out where I would like to control this alligator in the future. So I'll put a little cage around his belly. I'll drop some points on his tail. And after the computer sort of thinks about this shape, thinks about the geometry, how these uh, handles, if you will, will interact with the shape, then I can go and drag on these. Uh, and because I'm working with the geometry of the alligator, not the image, I can separate the top of, and the bottom of the mouth, and I can make him kind of look like he ate something here. So he'll be fat and happy, and we'll wiggle his tail a little bit. OK, and then finally we can animate him. Okay, so that was just a simple example. Take a look at this. <laughs> so this is a, a animation from The Late Show. What you're actually seeing is a cartoon that's been composited on top of the video. Off stage, there's an actor who's live acting and driving a kind of animation based on the primitive one that I've shown you. So that tool that I showed you eventually grew and was combined with a lot of other really interesting features by the people at Adobe uh, and made a tool that could be used for live cartoon animation, a totally new application of cartooning. Um, it's really exciting for Adobe. They recently won an Emmy for their software that deforms cartoons. There's an entire cartoon Trump show that was based off of this segment um, and that the software turned out to be quite powerful for that. So, okay, we've looked at 2D characters. Let's take a, a look at something harder. Let's go to three dimensions. Most of the shapes around us are really 3D, so we should understand three-dimensional surfaces. So a 3D alligator like this, if we zoom in on it, can see that we can also represent this shape no longer as one big polygon, but a collection of many tiny polygons. And we'll choose the simplest polygon. We'll take a triangle. So if we stitch together lots and lots of little triangles, we can represent arbitrarily complex shapes like this uh, three-dimensional alligator. A shape like this might be 100,000 to a million triangles. So if all of these triangles mesh together perfectly, then this will perfectly describe what's inside of the shape and what's outside of the shape. So imagine that we poured water from the top inside of this bunny. We would see that none of the water is able to leave. And in fact, in our academic community, we say that a mesh of triangles that has this property is watertight. We know what's inside and what's outside. Unfortunately, most of the models that we actually would find out in the world look something like this. We can see that all the triangles have been kind of fractured and broken apart. And if we try to do the same thing, fill it with water, well, it's just going to flood all the way to the outside. And we're not going to be able to tell what's inside or outside. But if you, know, if you and I look at this, we see that this is a bunny, right? We might see that it has some noise or some artifacts, but we see that this is supposed to be the surface of a bunny. So how can we help the computer see what we see? And it's not just for this water trick, right? We really do need to know what's inside and what's outside. If we want to do an elasticity simulation of this screw to find out how much stress it goes under when we bend it, then we need to pack it with tiny elements that'll measure the stress. And this will guide the simulation. 
This packing of tiny elements requires knowing where we put them. We put them in the inside. Um. <laughs> So nobody wants this to happen to their TEDx presentation, uh, but this is basically what our algorithms are doing to us. It's garbage in, garbage out philosophy, right? So this kind of attitude, while it makes it really easy for us academics to design algorithms, we say like, well, you just give me clean input, and if, if you don't, I'll just throw an error, and it's your problem. Sort of clean it up, and, and, and I'm not even maybe going to tell you why I failed. Just a sort of fatal error, you're done. My attitude is completely different. My attitude is that we should design our algorithms to gracefully degrade when they have problems. A core issue with geometric data is that we can easily create things that look good enough to us, but aren't good enough for geometric computation. So there's, there's sort of a, a problem in the mismatch of things that are good enough for visualization are not good enough for geometric computation. So to give an example of a surface geometry like this, we said, okay, we're gonna make it out of lots of little triangles. If we allow the user to place two triangles on top of each other, this will cause a self-intersection, a surface that goes into itself. We think about the geometry around us, your surface is just, well, it's just the boundary between what the thing is and what's not the thing. How could it intersect itself? Leads to a lot of contradictions. You can also stitch many triangles around the same point. We call this non-manifold. This is meaningful to mathematicians. But to us, we can think of it as we start on the bottom triangle and we walk across the purple edge. We should always know where we're going to go. But here we're at sort of a weird split junction. Do we go to the top or to the left? Then we might have open boundaries. Maybe the artist who is making this model for a computer game uh, just sort of got fed up making that pocket and didn't decide to continue it. The surface just sort of ends. All of these problems don't really affect seeing what this shape is, um, but they're going to break our notion of what's inside and what's outside. So my idea is to adapt traditional algorithms and theory from mathematics to work even in the presence of messy data. So let's take an example of a simple 2D curve. You know, if we thought about this, how do we tell what's inside and what's outside? Probably each of us in this room could think of some kind of algorithm, some kind of recipe to determine what's inside, what's outside. Maybe you walk until you hit a wall and go all the way around or something like that. But what happens when I start puncturing this shape or adding little flaps and bits to it or letting it self-intersect it itself? Now this is a much messier problem and it requires a more robust solution. Well, for clean shapes, there's a beautiful set of theory in mathematics called the winding number. And this indicates what's inside and what's outside. This is the formula for the winding number. Some people might be getting scared here. You're seeing some symbols, some Greek. Let's just make it blurry and forget about it for a second. <laughs> the winding number we can define intuitively. For this curve and some query point, some point that we'd like to know is inside or outside, what we're going to do is we're going to walk around the curve and meanwhile trace what we're doing on a little circle around our query point. If we go all the way around that point, then we'll add up the length of that circle, which will be 2 pi, and we'll just call that 1. So we'll say we're inside of the shape. If we watch what happens when we're outside of the shape, we see that any positive amount we go in one way around the circle gets canceled out by some negative length in the other direction, and we add up to 0. <laughs> This already, even for clean geometry, encompasses a lot of interesting things. So we can have nesting, we can have uh, things that are flipped inside out will get a negative value. That's useful. It'll tell us whether we're in a flipped inside out part of the shape or some self-intersecting part of the shape. In fact, this entire slide, if we treat this as a multi-component curve, still makes sense in terms of this winding number value. So what we asked was, well, what if I don't have a full curve? Can I still compute this thing? And we notice that you still get a well-defined value. It's just no longer 1 in one region and 0 in the other region. It's a continuous or smoothly varying value that goes from near 1 when you're sort of inside to near 0 when you're outside. And if we consider what happens as we get closer and closer to a closed shape, we see that this, in some sense, encodes the likelihood that we're inside or outside of the shape. And it perfectly agrees with our traditional notion of inside or outside once we have a perfectly clean shape. We can consider more complicated examples like this where we have some overlapping pieces. 
And if we turn it uh, sideways and view it as a height field, we can see that it very clearly delineates what we would normally think of as inside versus outside. You can sort of just imagine sk skimming a knife underneath of it to determine what's inside or outside. If we de-blur that uh, formula for a second, we wonder how do we actually compute this on the, on the computer? How do we code this up? Well, it turns out this is just a sum of all of the angles that are made by the, each of the pieces of our polygon. So we really just have to add up the angle that we're making. And voila, we get this nice formula. So it did turn out that those angles that we learned in high school are useful for something, but we had to see the big picture to see how it might fit in. The generalization to 3D is a little bit more complicated. We have to consider what a triangle does projected on a sphere. Uh, but in the end, it's also a collection of angles that we can just compute. If we look at what the values looks like, look like on a complicated 3D shape, we'll see something like this. So we're sort of slicing through the volume of this model of a head, and we're seeing that when it pauses in the middle, the mouth region, the cavity, is being correctly identified as being outside of the shape, despite a lot of artifacts and problems with this shape. So now we can see one example of how the computer can understand messy shapes the same way that we do. So here we're seeing that messy uh, bunny come back. And on the right, we're seeing how the computer now, with this equipped with the winding number, can determine what's inside and what's outside. Being able to turn, uh, determine what's inside and outside is our core fundamental routine that allows us to do things like physical simulation for structural analysis. We want to find out if this foot, when dropped on the ground, where it will break. We can analyze this through the stress field. Um, if we want to do functionality-driven design, uh, we can do something like this, where we optimize the weight distribution inside of this horse so that it balances precariously on one foot at the edge of the table. Now, I'll close uh, by uh, sort of recapping and saying that geometric data is everywhere. Geometric data that we find in the wild is quite messy. But if we're careful about answering tricky questions, tricky basic questions, then we can unlock this geometric data's full potential. And with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, friends, uh, funding agencies, and collaborators, and thank you very much for your attention.